The only easy day was yesterday. Welcome to The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday, the official Navy SEAL podcast. In training, when you push yourself to the limits, there's always a risk of injury. In the special operations field, this is even further magnified. Today, we speak about the fundamentals of fitness and injury prevention with expert Don Kessler, a man from the highest levels of competition. He's on the ground every day helping special warfare trainees perform their best and has some solid advice. Let's get started. Thanks for taking the time to sit down with us and and speak about uh, what you do for NSW. First, let's talk a little bit about you uh, for a minute. 40 plus years of a physical fitness background um, with athletes varying from high school students to Olympians. What do you think uniquely qualifies you for your specialized position that you have at NSW? Well, I started out as a hospital corpsman uh, after getting my master's degree in physical education. And this was during the Vietnam time. And I eventually got stationed at the U.S. Naval Academy. And uh, working as a hospital corpsman there, I moved into athletic training as uh, my profession. But I had years of experience in the military going into that. And I loved it so much that I decided I was getting out of the military to continue on in athletic training. So I went through, again, working in high schools, colleges. Uh, I worked at uh, the Olympics. I worked with U.S. soccer. So uh, there were many different variations I went to. And when the time came to retire from college athletics, I didn't feel like I should stop. And so I contacted some people in the um, NSW community that I knew and said, I think I could be some uh, help or benefit to them. And they said, we agree. Uh, They thought that my experiences would be able to help teach some of these people some of the things that we do in athletics, but also that we should treat the NSW people as Division I or professional athletes. How does the training that you do now specialize um, from the typical sports medicine that you've seen earlier in your career? My job uh, in the medical side of uh, BUDS training is that I'm to do the functional rehabilitation. So we have three physical therapists that work with us that will work with the initial part of an injury, and I'm to functionally get them back into full action. Uh, They call it the bridge program, taking you from the very simple things of coming out of an injury or post-op and getting you back to able to do the obstacle course. So that's what my job is. It's unique uh, among any of the programs that we have in that I have to know what are the things that they ask of the students, uh, both SEAL and SWIC, to make it through the training. And so my, my functional rehabilitation is built towards what do you need to do to pass or what do you need to do to pass through Hell Week or the tour. So it is very similar to a lot of other athletic training, just a different kind of um, end game, so to speak, in terms of what their capabilities need to be. Uh, it, it's like with any sport, and I used to tell the students that I would have as athletic training students, that you have to look at the team you're working with and know what is required of them in each thing and even watch people coach them and decide if I'm going to rehab them, what am I doing specifically for that sport? If it's a thrower, if it's a swimmer, uh, if it's a runner, I need to know specific things I need to do to get them back to full um, rehabilitation. And so what I did was spent about two months just watching what they did in training and say, all right, when I go to do my rehab, these are the things that I'm going to need to incorporate in the functional training to get them back to full 100%. Is there uh, differences because of the loading that these guys are under a lot of times with heavy packs? It seems like to me that that's one of the differences between uh, training for a, a marathon or another body weight endurance sport versus the types of things that these operators do they carry a lot of gear. Would you say that that's accurate? In the, in the early phases of training, 
the heavy gear is just moved from one place to another. It's not something that they're really training with. Uh, they will eventually step it up and move it up until then they get later phases. But most of the problems we run into are things that involve endurance, whether it's a run, whether it's a swim, whether it's an obstacle course, and we have to get them ready to be able to handle those and repeat those over and over and over again. Do you see that the, uh, the injuries that you typically see are, like you just mentioned, are a result from maybe too sudden of an increase of exercise volume? I would say there is a, certainly an increase in volume. Some people come in trained too much for it already, and any addition that is made to their training puts them over the edge. Uh, the people who are peaking slowly have less problems, and that's what Bud's Prep does, and that's what Bo does, is to try to peak you and bring you along slowly. So most of that works fairly well. Many people come in way overtrained and become stale, as they say in, in athletics, and therefore start on the downslope, even though they're going to slowly start increasing what they have been doing. So I think it would be helpful if maybe you kind of unpack that a little bit, talking about the progression of um, the scale or, or, or intensity. You're talking kind of about like peaking in terms, do you mean uh, condition or wear on the body? Like, can you maybe unpack that a little bit? I would say more than anything else from the injury-wise, it's the wear on the body. On the physical therapy side, 60% of the injuries that we see on a daily basis are stress fractures. 60% are stress fractures. And so we have to slowly build them up. And if they do get a stress fracture, we have to again start at ground zero and build that up slowly. So uh, that's what I mean by that, with the prep students, they start them doing a little bit of running and try to increase that as time goes along and try to make it go faster. When they get to um, here, again, in uh, basic orientation, again, it starts a little bit slow, trying to show you what you're doing and doing it once in a while and then start increasing it as you get into first phase you will then have everything thrown at you every day. And then when you get to Hell Week, it runs on 24 hours a day. So it peaks, the progression does. Um, that gives them the ability, if you're doing this right, to be able to handle that peak. But some people come in too high already, or they try to do extra beyond what is needed to be at that phase, and then it's too much for them when they add more. I see what you're saying. So is there a difference between what the uh, SWIC recruits are seeing versus the SEAL recruits in this process? The SWIC and SEAL will start prep together and do everything the same in, in uh, prep. They will do bow together. And then after bow, uh, they will break off into their uh, branches. Uh, the BCT that the SWIC people will do will be a little bit modified. They won't be doing quite, the much as, uh, quite as much quantity, but they will still be doing the same things that the SEAL people are doing. So again, it's the same exact training. They keep right on up until they break out, and then there's just a slight variation as to the quantity that is done. Uh, you've mentioned the term bow a couple of times. Can you, can you tell us about, about that, what that is, what that means? Bow is basic orientation. Okay. So when the students come from prep uh, in Great Lakes, they are all start out in basic orientation. And it's a slow process of trying to learn what is required of them on a daily basis uh, for their swims, for their runs, for the obstacle course, um, for their barracks inspection, personal inspection. It's a watered-down um, advanced part of what's going to happen in the in the Hell Week or the tour or any other phase. And so they slowly, as the weeks go by, um, will increase the intensity of what they're doing and the quantity of what they're doing. Okay, uh, let, let's roll back maybe a few weeks or months in this kind of process. Um, I'd imagine part of the reason why your voice will be so helpful here is being able to have these recruits hear you before they arrive and go through this orientation process. This is, I think, the kind of the, the, the jewel of being able to talk to you. What do you think these recruits should not do when they're preparing for their PSTs before they even arrive? I would have to say it's, it's almost like getting ready for a track meet. You don't want to be training for a marathon to be able to do a one-mile race. And the same thing goes with preparing to go to basic training 
and then to go to uh, prep and then to go to bow, if you're trying to do the amount uh, quantity-wise and the intensity that you're going to need further down the road, you're going to break down beforehand. So it's important to remember there are requirements to pass the PST. Shoot for what you need to do to be prepared for those requirements and not worry about what you need to do to get through Hell Week. In that the amount of mileage you need to put in or the amount of lifting you need to put in or the amount of swimming you need to be in is nowhere near the amount that you're going to need later. But you need to be able to do well at what you're going to do at a lower level. But by being prepared to doing something at an upper level won't necessarily make you better uh, and may break you down when you get to that upper level. I think that's a really kind of important uh, distinction to make because we've talked with a number of people through this process and there's, there's a sense of continued reflection on um, the documents and the guides that have been well vetted and, and, and written for recruits through this process. Uh, I think that there's a tendency, especially coming from a very high performing collegiate background, all these people are, are athletes um, to want to push, want to push, want to be the best, want to, want to be the top. And I'm hearing that continuously, don't push to the point where you're, you're hitting your limits follow the measured approach, the crawl, walk, run approach that's kind of been echoed by a few different people. Um, so it's, it's good to hear that from you too. It seems like the guides that are available for people and the training uh, programs that are available for people are designed for your success. They're not necessarily for the, for the lowest people on the rung to be able to get through. That There was a measured approach for a reason and it's not only just um, to get people in the right condition but to prevent long-term injury Absolutely right. The, the, the people that I end up seeing for medical uh, treatment are usually those people who have pushed too hard. And that's why I was brought in, because they felt that in the past, if you were dropped because of a medical reason, many times you were left by the wayside and never really could get back into what was going on. And they found that many of these people were some of the best athletes that they had and they just overtrained or had a freak accident and got injured. And what we wanted to do is take that out and say, hey, we want people like that. We want people who will push themselves, but let's give them a framework to work in and rather instead of just going crazy and doing a lot to say, here's the measured amount you need to do to get better. And that's what we have honed over the years to say, I know exactly what it takes for you to have a fracture to get back to running full. And I know how many weeks it takes. I know how much intensity I have to do at each one. And if you add more to that, you're probably going to get injured again. And I've seen it time and time again. As it is with the people who have followed the pattern, and I'll just say with stress fractures. Um, we've dealt with stress fractures. I've had 148 guys I've used the Alter G, which is a gravity-assisted running. And of those people, all of them have passed. Only six people were re-injured, which is about 4%. And uh, the history with stress fractures is if you've had one, it's the best predictor of getting another one. And you have a 40% chance of being re-injured if you've had a stress fracture. So we've been able to hone that down to about 4%, which is amazing. I'm going off on lectures at colleges and universities to talk about that to try to help them with what we're doing. But that's what we're saying. We have done this. We have seen this. We have a measured approach as to how much you do. And the word we try to get out to you beforehand is don't wait to get hurt to do this measured amount. Do the measured amount beforehand so we can bring you along gradually through the training throughout the cycle. So for the people that don't have a world-class rehab facility whenever they're in the earlier stages of training, is there anything you can say to them about comparing the type of pain that's causing injury versus the pain of, of your muscles burning? Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, again, looking at most of... Like when to stop, I guess. Most of the people we've had are athletes of some sort, whether they're swimmers or water polo players, ice hockey players. They have an idea from high school training or college training about what I need to do to get in shape. And there is that you know, soreness when you start getting in shape. But after that, it never should be a real soreness. You should say, hey, I got a good workout, but you never should be getting sore that the next day, oh, I don't think I can do it. If you're doing that and you're getting more sore each day, 
then you already started overtraining. And that's one of the best things that we're trying to say is that, yes, there should be a breakdown, but there also has to be recovery. You just can't keep pushing every day, although you can do running one day, swimming a day, biking a day, almost like a triathlete and say, hey, that will get me there. It gives different parts of my body a chance to take off, but I'm still working towards the end. And that's, that's the approach we push with uh, the patients who are already injured, but certainly is necessary for the people who are just starting out. Right. So let's say you're earlier, you're earlier on this, in this process, maybe you're six months into training for your um, PST, and maybe you, you sustain an ankle injury, or you, you, are, you, you determine that you maybe might have stress fractures. Uh, I'd imagine it's very important, and even more so later on in, in the process, to be able to maintain your engine, your, your cardiovascular capability through an injury. Is there anything you can recommend to people that might be, quote, nursing an injury early in this process to be able to keep their fitness level up instead of just drowning out? Absolutely. We always keep the conditioning. When uh, we have somebody who is injured, uh, and again, we'll use stress fracture as an example because it's one of the most uh, prevalent injuries that we see, those people, even if they are injured and are crutches, they are working out. And their workout for aerobically will be sitting uh, in um, the seat and doing an upper body arm bike. Uh, or they'll be swimming. And eventually, if they're off crutches, we may have them biking and changing the speeds and resistance and things like that. So they're constantly doing aerobic conditioning. And then we will eventually take them along to what the phases of running is concerned. But if they had an upper body injury with, with swimming, say, or the obstacle course, Again, they're on the bike and they're pedaling away, or if they can run, they will run. So they will constantly keep their aerobic base going all the time, but we have to work to the specifics of what their injuries are and rehab that injury and then incorporate that into their fitness once they're capable of doing it. Yeah, so it seems like a little bit of that can be done uh, with common sense on your own if, you, if you're in the early stages of this training process. It, um, do something that you can do. And, and try to keep the intensity level going. Absolutely, the, ec except for the uh, one machine that we have is gravity specific. Everything else is something that you could have in the basement of your house. A bicycle, a uh, medicine ball, some dumbbells. There is nothing that I use in the rehab that involves anything complicated at all. And, and I have stations set up that People will be doing squats, or they'll be doing lunges, or they'll be doing hamstring curls. Um, they will be doing planks. They will be doing sit-ups, uh, dips, pull-ups. There's constantly things that they can do that involve no special equipment at all. And that's what we try to teach them is that you don't need to have big heavy weights of 400 pounds to be able to get through this. You need to move your body weight and be able to push that through what is required of you. So maybe if, if you could be the, the, the voice in a young recruit's ear who sees these really, quote, macho characters who are or almost beyond superhuman doing things that people would love to be able to do with their bodies. They're strong people, obviously. There's, there's a focus on strength that I think maybe is a little misplayed. I think a lot of the uh, most successful candidates are endurance athletes, like I've heard from other people. Maybe you could maybe summarize a little bit about that kind of philosophy that people have, like they need to be the strongest people on the block to be able to make it through this program. Is that true? Or maybe you can give some, some information there. I would say in the eight years that I've been here, there are certainly many SEAL operators who are pretty big, strong, intense, but not to the numbers that we see on movies or TV shows now that the average guy to be able to do what he has to do is an endurance athlete. And uh, I had an operator one time tell me I ne he needs to be able to carry our heaviest weapon 10 miles. He doesn't have to carry 10 weapons one mile. So they don't need to be that big and that strong to do it. They have to be big enough and strong enough to move things and move themselves with heavy backpacks and stuff. But the heavier they are themselves, the more chance they have of injury and the more difficulty they will have trying to get over the obstacle course or trying to make uh, four mile runs. Uh, so they have to get strength, but again, more than anything else, they need endurance. The activities they call for and are uh, posed the most strain on are going to be the tour and hell week, and it's difficult to make it through if you're too big. So I guess maybe if you could be the a word of wisdom for these young people 
um, to kind of instill some discipline into them on maybe self-reflection of, of what really is needed to get through. What kind of advice would you give for people in terms of ref taking a look at themselves and, and seeing what, what should be you know, their goals and such in terms of their physical fitness? I think their goals should be what their PST is first. What do they need to do to pass the PST and do well? Do you need to be really strong, have a heavy bench press or a squat to do it? I don't think so. Uh, and that is the first objective they have, a need to pass that and do well with it, which is going to include speed and endurance and some strength. But it's not going to be an over amount of any one of those. As they move further down the line in the training, they're going to ask more of them and the more of it will be more endurance than it will be strength. So be very careful of not trying to do too much of one, thinking it will carry over into one of the other fields of swimming or endurance running, knowing that that is one of the many measures. And so what, what happens with push-ups after a while, hell week especially, I tell them, the only time you really need neck exercise is when you get to hell week. The strength you're going to need is on the obstacle course, climbing over that, um, doing um, the climb up the tower, things like that. And that's what I put in my uh, training is what, what are parts, some parts of the obstacle course because that's something I know you're going to have to do outside. Let's make sure that you have the strength and endurance to do it in here and then I'll let you go to the obstacle course and do one obstacle. How'd you do with that? And we move them along like that. So, you know, none of it has involved that hey, I need to get your bench press up or your hand clean up or anything like that. I don't do any of that at all. Uh, we work on muscles that um, are not even shown in most strength things. Uh, they're shown mostly in rehab because that's what's injured. Posterior shoulder, glutes, hamstrings, things that people, it's not glorified, they don't see it, but when a SEAL breaks down, a SEAL instructor breaks down, um, those are the things that happen. And we say to them, wow, if you'd have done this way back when, you probably wouldn't need this shoulder operation as a 30-year-old operator. You know, Pitt was involved in some big studies there, and I looked at all the injuries that the SEALs had. And I saw, well, a lot of these are the same as what these guys are getting in our training. If I show them this now, Hopefully it'll carry through their career that they'll do that twice a week and be able to keep from being, you know, an operable candidate. Because we take care of the, the SEAL and SWIC instructors too. And the injuries that they have, which are much worse now because they're in operable condition, are the same exact things that the kids get other than stress fractures. Most of the guys have gotten smart enough to either not running much anymore or they know exactly how much they need to run to do what they need to do, you know. But that's, that's what you look at and see. Are there any, um, uh, we mentioned stress factors, are, are there any other major issues that you see with people coming, quote, off the street when they enter into BUDS um, that you would like to maybe kind of nip in the bud or along the lines in the guide that you would like to address? Uh, I would say shoulder and back are two big things. Um, and the shoulder is the rotator cuff. Uh, very few people do much of it. They really only think of it with a throwing injury, but the rotator cuff is very important in all the things that you do because it stabilizes your shoulder before you do any exercise. And it's not shown in a, a weight room as an exercise that's going to make you look big and strong because it's three tiny little muscles that are underneath the deltoids that nobody sees. But if they go, and they always go first because they're very small and very weak, then you can't do anything else. Or you dislocate your shoulder, you tear your labrum, and it can all be prevented by doing some rotator cuff exercises. And... Um, they are simple exercises. Uh, we call them the, the T, where you take dumbbells, light dumbbells, and lift them in the front, in the side, in the back. Uh, external rotation exercise, where you're lying on your side and bring your arm up. And uh, one exercise for the supraspinatus, which is called the empty can. And those exercises are done as a preventative thing, but they are the base. If you don't have a um, good rotator cuff, you have difficulty in the obstacle course, boats overhead, logs overhead, all those things. But also in bench pressing, every year in football, when springtime would come around and everybody was trying to do their maximum weights, I would have football players with shoulder injuries. And most of it was rotator cuff from trying to bench press and build up those muscles, but do nothing for the rotator cuff. And I would just back off on how much they were lifting, 
work on the rotator cuff, and they'd get better, and then we could increase their weight. So it's important to keep that as a basis all the time that I have a strong rotator cuff. And it's not more than 15 pounds that's needed. I mean, it's a very light weight that anybody can have in their basement to do four simple exercises uh, for strengthening for that. The other is the back. One of the most common injuries, not only in our uh, environment, but in society in general. And people will want to do all kinds of exercises that involve bending over and twisting and, and lifting, which are the worst things that you can do for your back. Uh, people who have disc injuries, uh, people who have uh, uh, stress fractures of their back are usually from bending over and lifting something without getting your feet underneath you, almost like a squat to pick it up. And so if you do those as exercise, as prevention, you're actually doing the worst thing you can do because that's what injures you. So it's more important to do the tiny little muscles that are around the spine um, that you can strengthen just by doing planks. And you can do a front plank and a side plank and a back plank and all variations. You can do it for time. Um, there are all kinds of ways you can do it, but those strengthen the core muscles uh, around your spine and then you can start doing uh, sit-ups and uh, extensions only if your core is strong. And those simple things, which involve 15 pounds at the most and or your body weight, will prevent most of the other injuries that we see. So focus a little bit more on some of the less glamorous exercises, it seems, um, in support of the bigger body parts and, and muscle groups. That's a very good point. I think a lot of people totally miss on yep. how many times have we seen people in the gym doing curls and doing bench press. And these are the, quote, strong guys in the gym. Um, and then next thing you know, right there on crutches or the shoulders. So like. basically we've, we've started kind of from the top and we're working our way down by talking what I just did about shoulder and then the core. The next would be your uh, uh, legs, which would be most of the people will spend it doing squats or lunges or something that's going to be working on their quads and do very little for their glutes and their hamstrings. And again, it should be a balance. There should be a balance of the percentage of strength from your quads to your hamstrings. And we see this with problems with hip injuries later on. And again, just like the shoulder, we may see it as a strain of uh, the muscles in the hip, or we may see it as a labral tear, which again is cartilage in the, in the hip, just like in the shoulder, or we may see it that you may have sciatica, nerve problems, things like that because of poor position now because your quads are so much more dominant than your hamstrings. And so again, I've seen this with all sports uh, throughout uh, high school and college was the emphasis is on, I need to have this strong quads. And yes, you do. But if the ratio becomes such that you have a five to one ratio in many cases, let's say you could squat 500 pounds, I'm sure we could hardly find anybody that could curl 100 pounds with their hamstrings. So again, that's why I say it's a five to one ratio. And when you work out, I mean, when I'm running and doing something explosive, that ratio has to be one to one. If my quad strength is five times what my hamstring strength is, where do you think the injury is going to happen? And where do we see this in the NFL and baseball? What is the major injury you see that they say, oh, we have a Hammy, it's hamstring, yeah, right. and no one understands why, why we have it? Well, I can tell you, if your leg is extending with a 500-pound force and you only have a 100-pound force to slow it down to keep it from hyperextending, after a while, it's either going to fatigue or it's going to be overcome by that strength. And so that's what we need to think about is, yes, you need to do the quad work, but Remember, there's a balance of front to back and everything we do. When the shoulders, what I talked about, yes, you can do bench press, but you also have to do the posterior part of your shoulders. Here, yes, you can do squats and lunges, but you have to remember, I have to do some hip extension work. I have to do some hamstring curls to try to balance it out and get the ratio better. And this can even prevent some things like the runner's knee, because again, you're so quad dominated that in a true running form, you should be more glute dominated. And if we get those stronger and get that explosion, it's supposed to be the long, the biggest, strongest muscle in your body. Well, there's a reason for that because it's supposed to be one that explodes to drive you forward. And so you want to strengthen those glutes and strengthen the hamstrings to balance it out. If you don't, you'll have knee problems. So we see that also.
So in, in terms of maybe the lower extremities, you know, um, ankle, knees and such, a lot of that seems to be just volume of training, right? Wear and tear, or is there any preventative maintenance that can be done there? There, there is preventive maintenance. And again, if you look at many athletes, from their knees down, they haven't done anything. They may do some calf raises. You know, and that's usually common that they're straight leg calf raises and they got a barbell on their shoulders or they have leg press and they put their feet out there and that's, that's all they do. And that's good in most cases, but in reality, it only really helps the gastroc, right? And there are two muscles that are in the uh, lower leg that are combined, and that's the gastroc and soleus. And the soleus attaches below the knee, and so you actually have to do the exercise bent legged also. So we teach that yes, you want to do the straight leg, but you also need to be seated with a weight on your thighs and do calf raises that way, so you involve the soleus. And the soleus is really the muscle that you use more for running because your knee should be slightly bent uh, as you run. You really don't get to full extension of your leg until at the very last push off, okay? So you need that soleus in there. Most people don't do that at all. And also with their stretching, they don't do, um, a stretch, they may do this, the straight-legged stretch, but they won't do it with a bent knee. And you need to stretch one straight-legged and one bent because, again, their attachments are above and below the knee. But not only just those because, uh, again, now we've overemphasized the back of the leg. We haven't done anything to the front or the side. And that's, again, where we see a lot of problems with the stress-related problems is that the anterior portion where your anterior tib is lifts your foot up and toes. Well, when we're running in soft sand, there's a lot of that going on. And they have difficulty with boots, even lifting that up high enough uh, to get over it. And so they start using that a lot. So you need to do some anterior tib raises. And again, it's not a lot of weight. It's a thousand foot strikes per mile. So you need something you can do a lot of repetitions with. Now, I can't tell somebody go out and do a thousand reps of that, but you need something with resistance, whether it's your hand, whether it's a towel, whether it's a band, and get sets of 20, sets of 50 that you're doing um, that motion. And so we get to the ankle instability when we are running in soft sand or on the beach and you step in something, you have to have the ability to be able to handle all the different directions because your ankle is going to do it. So that means you have to do an inversion and eversion. And again, if you use your towel, uh, your hand, or again, a, a resistance band, and go through those motions and use your pronius longus, you use your posterior tib muscle. Those are muscles that, again, we don't require any extra equipment. We don't require um, any, much, any more time, any more resistance. It's just a matter of getting those repetitions in. And the last thing I'd say is that uh, one of the exercises I have to do with our stress fracture guys is to th just throw a towel out on the floor and curl it up with your feet, just like you'd be curling it up with your hands and your toes, because the muscles that flex your toes are running up the inside of your leg, and they also support your arch. And so if I strengthen those and get those used to repetitions, that will make it so that I might not have as much difficulty uh, running in soft sand and boots and also prevent plantar fasciitis too. So I mean, they're, you know, we've basically gone from the, the shoulders down, a lot of simple little exercises that balance out things that you're already doing. Those are the preventative things that we see are neglected and they end up being the things that get injured. I think that's a really good summary. One thing I think that would be helpful if, if you covered, and, 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 and my guess is the reason why a lot of these bigger muscle group movements are predominantly focused on in a lot, like you said, football, strength, whatever, because they're, they're impressive numbers and they're measurable, where it's like um, a lot more difficult to maybe do some of that type of measurement with like the exercise you mentioned about curling a towel with your feet. What ways can people measure these types of movements um, really simply, uh, maybe you can talk to that a little bit. Yeah. I'm one who really believes in using objective measurements in the lifting that we do. And I want to know exactly how much somebody is lifting and, and what they need to be, as I feel over 46 years of doing this, knowing it takes this amount of strength to be able to prevent that as a rotator cuff. If, if in an athlete you can't do 15 pounds, you're probably going to have problems. So I know that if I'm starting with five, I know where I need to get to and can make those progressions. In some of these exercises, it's difficult to do that, and that's why we ask for repetitions instead. But you can even push that a little bit. Um, and again, trying to get as objective as possible, say with the towel curl exercises, you again start out and they get easy and you're doing 50 of them, then put a book on it. 
build it up. And if that gets easy, uh, put your boots on it and pull it in or put a, a um, cement block or something on there that makes it more difficult. But again, with all the lower leg injuries, we are saying you are going to do a thousand foot strikes per mile. Um, during some of this training, you're going to be running six to 10 miles a day. So you need to prepare yourself for that. Now, again, I'm not asking that you do 1,000 to 6,000, but you need to be doing sets of 20, sets of 30, uh, so that your body at least knows what to do and you can start strengthening those muscles. Great. A lot, like we talked about this being a, a lot about endurance, a lot about body weight. So, and you've mentioned that there's not a tremendous amount of equipment that's re required for you to be able to hit your PST number and come into buds. Right. Um, and, and we talk about endurance being very important. Can you talk a little bit about footwear? Uh, I, I think there's some trends out there for, for barefoot style running shoes um, and or running barefoot in sand, all this kind of stuff. But they won't have that option when they get there. Right. They will just be boots. There's no, and the boots they get were the ones that everybody has issued. We can't even change the style of the boot until after they're into second phase. So the footwear that um, they're gonna wear, I would tell them not to train in that uh, and it'll, it'll throw off their mechanics uh, and it's more important to have good mechanics and run properly. Um, and I would say more, more towards the barefoot in that you'll have a better style. And then as you add shoes, as you add uh, boots, your body will adapt to that. But um, I certainly don't recommend people going barefoot who haven't run barefoot before. Um, again, with anything, you now add a new exercise, it's a shock to your body. And again, I want to add steps of how many repetitions or how many days a week I do that. And um, it's a matter of adjusting for your body uh, to the stresses and new stresses that you're uh, adding to it. So it's kind of unique in that I've been doing it for about six years watching you know these guys run and we've got all these stress fractures. And again, it probably best, again, to get them early or to get them up at prep, and I'm not moving to Chicago, I can tell you that right now. I moved from New Jersey here 13 years ago, and there was a reason. But, you know, when I was trying to get them ready, they had to be able to pass their four-mile run or three-mile run. And so I knew I not only had to get them back in condition, but they had a definitive line, as you said. It didn't matter about push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups. They had to pass their four-mile run. If they didn't pass it, you know, no matter what we did rehab, they were out. So I'm going like, how do I make them most efficient? I know this is post-stress fracture, guys. I know that they've got to wear the boots. I know it doesn't matter if I put an orthotic in it or not. It's going to be in the ocean, wet and sandy. You know, that's not going to happen. Uh, that I know that they're going to be running on the beach, high tide or low tide. Uh, I know they're going to be wearing those pants. And I know it's always a four-mile run, and I know what the time is, 32 minutes, then 31, then 30. So... How do I know that when I'm teaching them to get back to running, I'm making the most efficient that I can? They're broken for whatever reason. How do I know that if I do this and make them better, they, they can? So at that time, um, a tour group came through, Alberto Salazar. I don't know if anybody's familiar with him at all. Alberto is the coach of the Oregon Project for Nike and has taken the U.S. and the world's best distance runners and worked with them. And Alberto was coming through. And it just was timely that I'm about that same time scratching my head going, oh, you know, I, I can get the limp out of somebody. I can make them stronger. But is this the best they can be with what they have? And so I posed that to him. And, he, and I said, you know, I don't really know that. And again, having worked athletics for over 40 years, that a distance coach has ever said, well, this is the best way to run. You know, this is the most efficient way. And he goes, well, I coach that. We'd never beat the Kenyans if we didn't take care of everything, including technique and diet and sleep. I said, wow, I'd love to learn. And he goes, well, come on up and see. So I went up to, to Nike at his invitation. And he, the first thing he did, he sat me in front of a computer and said, watch these high-speed films and talk me through what they were doing. And then he showed me footplate films of how the foot was landing. And then we went to the treadmill and had Galen Rupp. And if you know, Galen is uh, the 10-time 10,000 meter champ of the US and silver medals in the 10,000 meters in London and only the second time he ever ran the marathon got the bronze medal in the last Olympics. So you go, not a bad runner. I, I guess he's done something right with him. And he's coached him since he was in high school. And so he had Galen on the uh, treadmill and went 
absolutely, you know, here's what he's doing, here's what I'm watching, here's what I'm coaching, here's what I'm trying. And it was like some of the things were just like, wow, I, I've never seen that, never known that. And so that night, I stayed up there for three nights. I'm a runner myself. I've been running for over 50 years and tried, you know, one of the things on myself, you know, and it's like, wow, that feels a lot better, you know. It's like, wow, that's the next day tried, you know, something different, and I kept feeling better with it. And so I got back, and I started doing research on the medical side to say, all right, if I'm more efficient to make me faster, does that make me have less injuries? And so started looking at each thing on research-wise and went through about 200 research articles and said, when you break them down individually, yes, they do. And so started putting that together. And so I started teaching my guys uh, who had stress fractures. And the first thing I remember was an ice hockey player from Brown University had bilateral stress fractures. And you watch him run on the treadmill and he went, oh my God, he looks like he's still ice skating. You know, it's like one of these all over the place. <laughs> had trouble passing his four mile run. And so started doing what I call the faster program. And he got better. He even said to me like, my legs would always get tight as soon as I started running. My shins would, and I don't feel that at all. It's like, oh, that, that was a good sign. That's a, and eventually he got, and got out and running. He ended up passing, going through Hell Week and everything else. He said he knocked three minutes off his four-mile time and now is on the team. He's on the East Coast. You know, he's been there for a couple of years because he's been doing this for about two and a half years. And Alberto posed the question to me, what kind of sports background did I come from? I said, no, I have never really looked at that and started looking at it. And... As you would think with stress fractures, it was swimmers, water polo players, ice hockey players, and we always used to say, hey, it was bone density. And yet we do bone density tests and calcium tests and vitamin D and everybody be within normal limits. But you look at these guys and watch them run to, to evaluate the first time and you went, oh my gosh, no, wonder. no one's ever shown you how to run because you didn't need it to be a good swimmer. You didn't need it to be a good ice hockey player, but you're not a good runner. So I found out Keeping track again over all this time, over 75% of the guys who got stress fractures are from sports that are non-running sports. And I you know, already named them. If you were a soccer player, football player, lacrosse player, you could still get it. Most of the time it's from overtraining. I actually filmed the guys for 15 seconds from the side and 15 from the back and watched the running mechanics. And then we sit down from the app and go over each of the six things and... I've had great success with it. You know? And the whole point is, again, not overtraining. When I start training them back again, I don't ever let them even do a four-mile run. They do intervals where they're doing 30-second uh, intervals, short recovery, and do that for three miles maybe, or they're doing minute intervals that were trying to build up their strength and their aerobic capacity, but not trying to just do mindless miles. And that's what I see kids do is to get ready for the PST or to get ready for the four mile run, I'm gonna run eight to 10 miles a day and that will be easier. Yes, it'll be easier, but you won't necessarily be faster because you never worked on the mechanics and you never worked on the speed and power that you need to do to be faster. If you didn't use more muscle fibers to go faster, you can't go faster. I don't care if you ran 20 miles, you're not going to be a fast miler if you didn't do speed work to be that fast, you know. So that's what we try to teach. So I'll just, as a wrap that's up. That's much too long. Yeah, no, no. I, I, think, you touched, I think you touched on a very important it's part. It's where I got a rebirth at uh, 68 years old right. to say, wow, you know, this is something that's untouched. Why? Why? Yeah, just because you learned how to run when you were a kid didn't mean you learned the best way to and run. And actually, the command uh, saw that. 100% of the guys that I was working with were passing the four-mile run. They said, well, it's better than the rest. And we had guys who weren't injured and weren't passing the four-mile run, and they asked me to work with those guys for a while, and all of them passed. Again, just doing simple mechanics and doing shorter distance, um, but faster and a short recovery in between, intervals as such, right. and you know everybody made it. So, again, something that should be pushed earlier to say, hey, don't just go out and do mindless miles. Do some intensity, get some short recovery so that you're still pushing the heart and do that intensity again. And you'll do a lot better than just doing multiple miles of you know, a distance, slow, easy right? jog. Yeah. So in summary, um, if you had the ear of somebody who's going to be entering in this process in 15 seconds, what, what would be the quick elevator pitch to this kid that's going to enter the process? So I'd say balance, 
front to back, quads to hams, um, shoulder, and endurance. Think of, yes, I need strength, but I need to be able to do it multiple times for a long period of time. And so it's more important to have that endurance factor uh, to get through the early part of our training. Later on, as they become a SEAL, they become specific, but right now they need to be able to make it through the training, and the training involves endurance. Are there any resources available to these potential candidates to prevent this type of injury? Online there is the physical training guide and there are also some rehabilitation uh, exercises that are shown on videos that uh, they should be able to understand and be able to apply all these techniques. Well, uh, we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank it's you. been really, really helpful. Good. Find out more at sealswick.com and join us again for the next NSW podcast. Heads off, eyes open. Ah!